And good evening, I'm Jonathan Higgins, live right here in our Cincinnati studios, and this is Train Aficionado Live. So we've got a great show planned for tonight. If you're planning on doing any travel by train for a long distance, or you're a commuter on the train heading into work daily or weekly or whatever it may be, um, this is a great show to be able to learn some of the tips for being able to travel with a scanner on the train. So being able to monitor what to program, how to set up your radio. Um, so this is going to be a great show for those of you that plan on traveling by train or are already doing it and uh, the best way to use a scanner. So let's uh, take a look at some uh, slides right now. Um, this is tonight's discussion. Top five tips for using a scanner on a train. As always, we, uh, we strongly recommend checking out our store, trainaficionado.com. We have a brand new website, so definitely check that out, trainaficionado.com. And then click on the store link and you can shop our, our swag. We've got all types of uh, great things on the website, t-shirts, hats, hoodies, uh, travel mug, so many cool things. So make sure you uh, help support the channel by shopping our store at trainaficionado.com. Now available to watch on YouTube, Rail Fanning for Beginners. Um, great video that we put together a couple weeks ago. Make sure you watch that in case you missed it. Our next show, believe it or not, we're into July. July the 5th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific, live right here on YouTube. So we'll be live right after... Uh, the 4th of July on July 5th. And if you haven't already, make sure you follow, like, and subscribe to our social media as well, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And while you're here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And give us a thumbs up on that video as well, uh, whatever video you're watching, including this one. Here's tonight's discussion. We're going to talk about the top five tips for using a scanner on a train. We didn't put these in in any particular order, so sit back and relax. We'll uh, hopefully share some great knowledge with you tonight. First thing we want to talk about is how does railroad communication work? As you can see here from the uh, slide, it shows line of sight communication. So if you're familiar with scanners or two-way radios, typically the police and fire department are using what they call repeaters. So, you know, it's a tower that's up on a hill or a large tower, um, and there's what we call a repeater. It has a, an input frequency to the repeater, and then the repeater essentially repeats it on an output frequency so everybody can hear it. That's the basics of communication. Of course, we can take a deep dive on how a repeater works, but that's not necessary for the show. So we can see here on the diagram, we can see a couple of towers and a couple of scanners and a train. So typically when you're out rail fanning trackside, you can hear the dispatcher um, more often than you can hear the crew. For example, uh, if we're looking at the circle that, uh, the green circle that simulates the signal of the dispatcher, you'll be able to hear it on scanner number one, scanner number two, and of course scanner number three. Um, because, you know, it, you're within range of that, and that's going to go a lot further than the train crew. If you take a look at the brown uh, circle, that's the engineer and crew. doesn't go as far. As you can see here, the person on scanner number two and scanner number three are able to hear. Now, typically, when I do this chart, it's usually scanner number one and two for my classes. Scanner number three is as if we're on a passenger train. So that's, uh, you know, you being on the train and one of the passenger cars. So scanner number three is us on the train. So typically, if we're within range of that tower, we're going to be able to hear the dispatcher. Of course, us being on board the train, we're going to be able to hear the crew. We're going to be able to hear uh, the conductor and the engineer or sometimes there's multiple conductors on a train especially if it's a passenger train we're going to hear them as well communicating to one another or even communicating to the engineer of the train so little different from being trackside 
you know, you're on board the train, you're typically going to hear the crew all the time versus being trackside, you're only going to be able to hear that crew when they're relatively close to you in line of sight. So in order to be able to do tonight's presentation, we had to, we had to cover that so you can get a basic understanding of railroad communications. So we've talked about this scanner quite a bit on the Scanner Guys shows and the Train Efficient Auto shows, whenever we talk about it. It's the 125AT. This is one of our recommended scanners uh, for rail fanning. Now, if you look in the description on this video, there's going to be several links there to blog entries. So if you're not familiar with the 125AT or you're not familiar with rail fanning with a scanner, there's several blog entries listed there in the description. So you can read up on, you know, what's the benefits of the scanner, and you can read a rail fans review of the 125AT. And we actually have one more blog entry there that's there. We're going to talk about a particular antenna, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. Now, why the 125AT? It's simple to use. It's not that expensive. You're looking at about 130 bucks. Um, simple to use. It's a bank-driven scanner. It doesn't have any fancy dynamic allocated memory system or, or you know, object-oriented scanning. It doesn't have anything too wild and crazy. You go to channel one, go into the program mode, program in the frequency, program an alpha tag, and store it. You're done. It's relatively easy versus a lot of the other scanners that are two to three to four hundred and beyond that dollars so it's simple to use i strongly recommend this radio because it's small compact takes two double a batteries um and it works great it's not overkill for us rail fans the other question i get a lot well what about digital most of the railroads all the large railroads are using analog conventional they may be using NXDN maybe in a yard or somewhere where it's not going off into the road, essentially. All the road channels, the dispatch channels for all the big uh, railroads use analog. So an analog radio would be fine. The only places I've ran into digital is on some of the scenic railways where, they sh where they're the only one on the line. And they're not sharing it. So digital will eventually come... I don't know when it's going to be a huge undertaking. One, you know as well as I do, uh, for instance, Amtrak travels on other railroads as a guest. Norfolk Southern, CSX, UP, so on and so forth. So they travel as a guest on those various railroad lines. In order for them to communicate, their equipment needs to be functional with that particular road. In this case, it's analog. So, you know, other railroads share other lines as well, such as, you know, uh, a foreign uh, equipment going on a certain line. So in order for digital to happen, everybody needs to make the migration to getting digital two-way radios in the cabs of their locomotives. All the portable radios need to be digital. As railroads upgrade their equipment, they're probably purchasing digital radios. Digital radios will typically work on both digital and analog. So when they do make the move to digital, they'll be able to do it with the radios that they have. But this is going to be a huge undertaking. It's going to be a team effort across all the railroads because you can't have some of them operating on a digital channel on the road frequency. And then you have other people that are using it um, and their radios are only analog. So... A uh, prime example, uh, as mentioned in the chat, is uh, PTC. That was a huge undertaking. So that kind of put back, you know, the, the change over to digital. Eventually it'll happen. I don't know when. It could be quite a while. It's going to be years and years off. But the 125AT is an analog radio. It's going to work perfect for what we are using today with a few exceptions. The other great thing I like about this radio versus a lot of the other two-way radio, other scanners, I should say, is it's got an alpha tag display. So you're able to program in a alpha tag along with a frequency. So something that's relevant to that particular channel. Let's say if it's uh, INO Road or whatever you want to put in there, 
Norfolk Southern Road or even put in, you know, the division, you know, road channel dispatch, however way you want to program it in. It's call, almost like the old school caller ID, you know, so you have the phone number and the uh, caller ID. In this case, you're programming in the frequency and the alpha tag that's associated with that channel. This scanner is robust. It has over 500 channels. It will work off of AA, two AA batteries. You can also plug it in with its USB cable. You can use a cigarette lighter USB adapter or a um, AC adapter, just like your cell phone. It comes with a, with a USB cable and then you would put a wall wart for the AC current at your house or you would do a cigarette lighter with a USB in your vehicle sometimes in some of your vehicles they already have USB power uh, outlets so you can just plug directly into there great thing about it if you're using this in the vehicle plug in when possible you don't want to be draining those batteries you can use AA batteries or you can use rechargeable AA batteries you know you pick whatever um, type of batteries you want to use if you are using rechargeable batteries I recommend recharging those batteries in an external charger versus doing it in the radio. It's going to be a lot faster to charge up those batteries. And in case something happens to those particular batteries, when they're being recharged, let's say something goes wrong, it's ruining your recharger. It's not re ruining your actual radio. The other thing that I mention all the time, if you're going to invest into the radio, I strongly recommend a carrying case. Carrying cases are definitely great, especially for rail fans. I don't have my 125 AT right next to me, but I can show you a carrying case if I can pull it off. This is my SDS 100. Soft leather case. It's got this awesome belt clip, so you can get the same type of case for your 125 AT. And this is the great thing. It's rugged, you know, and, and you can put this on your belt clip in order to take it off, slide it upside down and pull off. And then when you put it back in, just drop it in and look at this. It's not going to go anywhere. That I strongly recommend if you're looking to get a scanner. Um, a lot of people um, ask me about you know, those, those, those little radios that you can get on Amazon for 30 bucks. The issue with those radios is their scanning speed is not fast. It's not easy to program on the fly. And there's lots of benefits of doing a traditional scanner over a two-way radio. Typically, you know, as many of you have watched the show, I typically will have my Anytone radio, which I don't have next to me, and I have the uh, 125AT. So on my Anytone, I'm able to monitor two frequencies at the same time, simultaneously. And then I have my 125AT with me, and that will scan... All the frequencies I need so it'll do you know I can do a service search which I'll show you momentarily how to set that up and also being able to scan no known frequencies and it's going to do it relatively faster than a two-way radio the great thing about having a scanner I can program it on the fly I don't need you know my laptop and all this other stuff to be able to program it typically with a two-way radio you're going to need a computer it's going to be a pain in the butt even the program manually so a scanner is the best option for doing things on the fly and doing things trackside. The 125 AT is my favorite portable radio for rail fanning because of all the things I mentioned. Let's take a look at the next slide. We'll probably talk about the 125 AT a little bit more. Uh, matter of fact, I do have the radios. So let's take a look at, um, we'll, we'll keep talking about the radios. So this is my 125 AT. It's got a carrying case, which is really nice. Same type of belt clip. Uh, I also have this antenna, which I'm going to talk about in a slide. But this is the radio that I use. This is the 125 AT for rail fanning. This is the Anytone radio. It's an 8-something. I can't remember the model. Um, dual monitoring. Um, it's really nice. It's rugged like a two-way radio. Of course, when I program this, the transmits are off. So, you know, like if I try to hit the button by accident, it's just going to beep at me. Transmits are off. This radio, you know, goes for a lot more money than the 125AT. The reason why I have this 
and my 125AT. Um, I got a phenomenal deal on this radio when I purchased it years ago. The battery, because I don't transmit on it, lasts me for a whole entire rail fanning trip, pretty much. I do have a spare battery, so I always have a backup on me. And I can monitor dual, dual channels at the same time. Typically what I'll do is, yeah, I believe uh, uh, it's the uh, 878UV. Um, somebody just commented that. That does ring a bell. But yeah, I mean, it monitors dual channels. Typically I'll have the road in the dispatch. And then on this baby, I'll program any other radio, any other radio frequencies that I, that I want to have in here. So good stuff there. All right, let's talk about the antenna on the screen. So this looks very much like the antenna that's on their two-way radios. It's tuned for VHF 150 to 162 megahertz. This antenna works pretty well. Um, you can purchase this from Scanner Master um, when they do have it in stock. It's available in, of course, a BNC connection and also in an SMA connection. So if you are using something like the 125... AT, you're going to need the BNC connection. If you're using one of the Uniden radios that has a has an SMA connection, you'll need the SMA version of this particular antenna. So all good stuff uh, right there. So this is one antenna I would recommend. The other antenna that I would recommend is the Smiley uh, antenna. It's the uh, the Slim Duck eight uh, 160 megahertz antenna works really really well and that's the antenna that i actually have on my my both of my radios it's a rubber duck works great um made right here in the united states it's a small company uh smiley antenna you can look them up online there's actually a uh, blog post that's in the comments that you can read more about this antenna the great thing about this antenna is you choose the connector in this case i have a uh, BNC connector. This one here on my Anytone, I have a reversed SMA connector. So I can actually use one antenna and then get two different connectors and switch back and forth. In this case, since I use these these radios simultaneously, I purchase two antennas and then have um, an adapter for each. It comes with an adapter and of course you can purchase additional adapters if needed so smiley antenna a whole bunch of people that have taken my classes at the Cincinnati Railroad Club uh, in the uh, what was it, in the early spring uh, purchased these antennas and been blown away my dad um, I got him one of these antennas he's got the 125 AT and he was completely thrilled he said you know I'm able to hear a detector that I was never able to hear before. I'm hearing a lot more of the crew communication, and I'm hearing some of the additional towers that are further away. So it kind of brought in a lot more. And, of course, it's a tuned antenna to the railroad band. Anytime that you're using an antenna that's tuned to the band you're looking to monitor, it's going to be great. Some people ask, well, the scanner comes with an antenna. What's wrong with that one? Well, that antenna is a wideband antenna. It's going to work really okay across the board of all frequencies. You know, it's not going to be, you know, a, a, a king performer on one particular band versus another. It's going to work okay across the board. When you get something like this, it's going to work really well on the railroad frequencies, the 160 megahertz, and it's not going to work so great on probably 800 or VHF. Um, uh, yeah, UHF, I should say. UHF, it's probably not going to work that great. VHF, it's going to work fine. UHF, it's not going to be so great. Maybe on 800, it may not be so hot either. But it, it may work, you know, on those close systems. But it's going to work really well on the railroad band, that 160 megahertz. So Smiley Antenna, check them out. They're not a sponsor of the show. They just have a really great product. And I, I can't say enough about the antenna. It's well, in, uh, very well in constructed. I've had this antenna, I think, for at least a, oh, well over a year. I'm not too sure how long I've had this antenna, but it's been quite a while. And it's holding up great. All right, so we've talked about the scanner. 
we've talked about some antenna recommendations. Now, when you're on the train, you're with other people. And a lot of times they don't want to be able to hear your scan, your scanner audio. You know, you don't want to disturb the other people on the train. You know, you, you know, just like if you were listening to music on the train, you want to put some headphones on your earbuds or some sort of thing where you can just listen to your music and without interrupting other people. The same thing with scanners. So of course, you know, there's uh, earpieces that you can put in to your one of your ears. So you can still have a conversation with somebody else that you're riding with, or if you're riding by yourself, get some headphones, maybe, uh, uh, you know, headphones like what you see there. They still make them, believe it or not. Sony has um, headphones that you can buy for under 20 bucks that are wired. Um, so you can plug right into the headphone jack right on the scanner. So you can pop those in, listen to the scanner as you're traveling on the train. If you're lucky enough, to be able to have um, a sleeper, of course you can listen to your scanner without your headphones. You know you can have it on at a reasonable level in your sleeper car and and you know not bother anybody. But when you're riding in a passenger coach or with other people, definitely consider you know getting some headphones or an earpiece. Um, of course, you know the 125 AT does not have Bluetooth, so you're going to have to use a wired type of headset. You know as you can see there. And they're relatively cheap because it's old school technology with wires. So get something that's relatively inexpensive, plug it into the headphone jack and, and enjoy your scanner. Um, you know, I have uh, headphones that I put in, you know, like if I'm riding on a train, I'll have that on um, to be able to listen. I've done a train ride with my dad where I use the, uh, the earpiece that you saw there still able to have a conversation with my dad and then being able to listen to the uh to the railroad communications if you really want to block out <laughs> um everything on the train you know not hearing anything you can get a racing electronics headphones which dale mentions which are noise canceling <laughs> so <laughs> you can really zone out look out the window and look at the um, look at the scenery as you're passing and listening to the audio as well. But um, for the most part, you know, you don't really need to go to that drastic extreme. But if you're looking for something really high quality, definitely check out some of the racing electronics headphones that are available. But yeah, those are some really great options for being able to listen to that scanner audio. So... Typically what I recommend when you're traveling by train and you're using a scanner, you want to do some research on the route that you're on. Why do you want to do that? Well, um, if you're trying to program your scanner for the trip that you're on, a lot of times passenger trains are not operating on roads they own. Like I said earlier, they may be a guest on somebody else's railroad. Take, for instance, um, the Cardinal service that runs from Chicago to New York. Just traveling through the Cincinnati area, they're a guest on CSX's many different uh, lines. So in order to be able to kind of do some research to what frequencies they're going to be on, look up the route on this Open Railway Maps website. If you zoom into the particular uh, line, it's going to show what who who's on it. You know, maybe it'll show Norfolk Southern, you know, Cincinnati District or CSX Cincinnati District or Division or it'll say something like that. Then what you can do is once you know the line that they operate on, you're going to then go to Ready a Reference. Ready a Reference for each state has a list of railroad frequencies that are listed for each state for each railroad that runs through the state. So in this case, since they run on CSX's line, and you know the it's the Cincinnati um, subdivision, let's say they run off on that, then what you would do is look for look for that on Ready a Reference. It's going to show a road channel. It may show a dispatch channel. Those are two frequencies that you want to program in when they're on that particular channel. 
Now, for instance, a train that's running from Chicago to New York, during that route, they're going to change the frequencies a lot. They're going to go to the road channel of the line that they're on. So they, they're going to be switching channels quite a bit. Um, so you want to be able to keep up with those channel changes. Sometimes, depending on the crew, they're really good about it. And they'll say, switching over to 20, in which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what those channels are. And they'll, and they'll switch over to 20 together or whatever channel it may be. They may say, all right, I'm, I'm switching over to, to 50, 59. Uh, so pay attention to that on the radio and you'll know when they switch to it, then you'll switch to it. Or program in all the known frequencies for all the lines you're going to be traveling on and have the scanner, in this case, the 125AT scanning those known railroad frequencies that they use along the route. So radio reference, openrailwaymaps.com is a good source. So start at open railway maps, track the line that you're traveling on, and then see what divisions or districts you know they're on. Use that information, go to radio reference, look it up by the railroad, by its state, and then um, and then pull up those frequencies. Now you heard me mention channel 20. So the railroad has the AAR channels, which are designated channels for the railroad. And they're all numbered, as you can see here, all 97 of them on the screen. So each cab uh, uh, radio typically will have a knob to be able to scroll through the channels. So when they have to go to from 20 to 56, the engineer will go scroll right to 56, stop at 56, he's now on channel 56. As for the conductor, his radio is probably, his or her radio is going to be set up differently. So they will switch over to channel 2 or channel 3, whatever, and typically they'll have a piece of paper on their radio sometimes you know saying what each channel number it is it's not going to be fully aligned with the AAR channels uh, maybe they're portable set up for um, the cardinal service so that maybe the channels are programmed in order from you know Chicago to New York or something of that nature with us being scanner enthusiasts what I strongly recommend is Program in all 97 railroad channels into your scanner. Start with channel 1, go all the way to 97. Program them in in the same uh, channel. So if you're going to program in channel 5, it's going to go into channel 5 on the radio. Channel 6, channel 7, channel 8, 20, and, and so on and so forth. Match it up so it's perfect with the AAR channels. Now, why do you want to go through all that trouble? So let's say, you know, you're, you're taking a rail fanning trip and for whatever reason, you know, you've wrote down all the frequencies, but the thing is uh, something got changed. You know, they changed their road channel. So let's say you hear, or the other thing you may be is let's say they say go to 18 and like, shoot, what the heck is 18? What you can do on your 125 AT is press the hold button, press 1, 8, and then hold. It'll bring you to channel 18 because you went through all the trouble programming in all 97 railroad frequencies into your scanner. So that means that you can hop to whatever channel they go to quickly. So that'll only take up two banks, bank one and bank two. That leaves you eight other banks to be able to program in whatever you want for frequencies for the railroad. So if you wanted to put in your trip on the train on bank number three, have at it. Put that in there. You can put in bank number four, um, a place that you rail fanned often. Let's say you go to Altoona, Pennsylvania. You rail fan through there. You program the two or three frequencies that are, that are in use over there. Let's say you rail fan in Cincinnati. So maybe you put in like 12 frequencies into one bank. So with the other banks, what I recommend is programming in those areas that you frequent all the time. Now, the other cool thing about this, 
Now I mentioned you can jump to a frequency. Let's say you're on the train and all of a sudden you don't hear anything for an hour and you're like, uh oh, um, what happened here? So these two banks can be turned on on your scanner and you can scan all 97 channels. So if that happens, scan all 97 channels, it'll stop on the radio transmission and you'll be able to say, aha. So through this section, they're on channel 92. Okay, so now you can jot this down, say, okay, so when we're on this particular section on the route, they're on channel 92 versus what I had programmed in there. Let's say it was channel 59. So the great thing about it is this is a service search inside of the scanner. The scanner does have a service search, but I would strongly recommend programming it the way I mentioned, taking the first 97 channels and programming all 97 channels there, you're able to hop to a channel on the fly. So if you hear something, you know, they say, all right, uh, can you talk to me on 55? You can go, oh, okay, I'm going to go to 55 and listen right in. So typically when I, when we do this, I recommend using software to program all 97 railroad channels. You can do it manually on the radio, but I would recommend, you know, software for this particular radio, um, I recommend the Butel ARC125AT software, which will be in one of those blog posts that you see in the description of this video. So I can't stress enough, there's a couple of blog posts from trainaficionado.com that you want to refer to watching this video or after watching this video. I see that Mike is a brand new 125AT owner. Congratulations on that. Hopefully you're, you're, uh, you're learning uh, how to operate that and take the most advantage of that particular radio. So let's continue on. Batteries. I can't say enough about batteries. We need batteries. So um, typically the best places to buy batteries, from what I've heard, is IKEA. For whatever reason, I've heard good things about batteries at IKEA. So that's one place. Another place, go to your big box store. You know, your BJ's, a wholesale club, your your Costco, your Sam's Club. If you've got a membership to any one of those, get the 48 battery pack. If you go to, you know, any of the other stores and you buy, you know, the small package of batteries, you're going to spend almost just as much for half the for, for not even half the amount of batteries you would get from the from the big box stores BJ's warehouse um, Costco and Sam's Club so if you do have one of those memberships you go there I've heard good things about the IKEA batteries I haven't used them so I, I personally can't say whether or not I'll have to purchase them at some point and see how well it works but that's what I've heard so batteries as I mentioned earlier you want to make sure you pack your cable. If you're in your own sleeper room, you may be able to plug it in. Make sure you bring in your programming cable and the wall ward, the AC adapter wall ward. So here's the programming cable right here. And I don't think I've got one of the wall warts handy. But yeah, it's just, you know, take this, plug it in. Oh, I do have one handy. Here we go. And then, of course, yeah, that should be good. But yeah, I mean, this is a wall wart that you use for, you know, your iPhone. You may have a couple of these kicking around. Simply just take this, plug it into here. Then pull down the little flap over here. Plug it into here. Make sure on this radio, when you're just using it to, to power the unit, there's a little switch behind the batteries make sure it's set to alkaline if you're using alkaline batteries you want to make sure that's switched if you don't do that it's going to cause an issue with your alkaline batteries because you you can't charge alkaline batteries you can charge rechargeable batteries but yeah um but yeah i mean this is the cable that you would use for this particular radio so if you are in your sleeper plug it in and uh, use it if you were not able to plug in buy a whole ton of those batteries um, and have uh, some of those with you and easy to grab so when your batteries run low 
you're able to pop out the old batteries, put the new batteries in, and keep monitoring. Uh, typically for me, batteries will last six to eight hours on that particular radio. As long as you're mindful of a couple of things, you don't have the volume cranked all the way. Unless you're trackside and it's a noisy environment, you're probably going to have it cranked all the way. And you don't have the backlight on all the time. Now, since you're on the train, you may be using the headphones. You're not going to have it cranked all the way to 15. So that's going to be a huge saver in power because you're using headphones. You get the volume down lower. So it's not cranking out a whole bunch of power that way. And then the backlight, just make sure you turn that off. You don't run that backlight all the time because that will also drain the batteries as well. And then, of course, you know, as we talked about the Anytone, you get this on the train. Um, there is a headphone jack on the side of it as well. So battery lasts forever if you know the frequencies. Typically, even when I, even if I was traveling on the train, I would bring probably this and my 125AT. So if I got into a jam and I had to do a search of all 97, turn on bank one and bank two, run through the 97 channels until it stops, and then I'll know, oh, they moved to channel 16. So what I can do on my Anytone is I can tune this to 16, and then I can keep running this radio as a search, you know, searching for, you know, for channels and such, which is really nice. So batteries. And as I mentioned, it will work on rechargeable batteries as well, double A. Um, you definitely want to carry multiple sets of those in case you're not able to charge it on the train. All right, some top five extras. Now, how many of you have had these GPS navigational devices in your vehicle? Most vehicles now have the, the GPS built into the, you know, seven inch or eight inch screen that's on there now, or even bigger. Um, you know, it's built into the vehicle, but many of you had some of these navigational GPSs. The great thing about it, if you get one and it shows the railroad lines, you can use this on the train, especially if you have a sleeper. You plug this in into one of the outlets in the sleeper, and then you suction cup it to the glass, and you can watch where you're traveling through on the train. So this kind of keeps you knowing where you're at along the line, which is really neat. Instead of it, the, the little icon that represents your vehicle rolling on streets, it's going to be rolling along the tracks. And you'll be able to track exactly where you are. You'll be able to see your current speed, how fast the train's going. So if you have one of these navigational GPSs kicking around, I would strongly recommend it if you're traveling on a sleeper. You're able to see exactly where you are along the route, especially at night. And you'll even be able to see what your track speed is. So some really cool things there. They still sell these, and they're relatively inexpensive. I was looking for images for the slide deck, and I was able to find this image here. And it was, and you know, the, I said, oh, they still sell these, and the GPSs are not that expensive. Hopefully, you'll be able to get one like this where it shows the railroad lines, and you'll be able to follow along. So this is one of our top five extras. So being able to do that and then get the, the mount that suction cups to the glass. So you're sitting in your sleeper, suction cup that to the glass. You get your scanner. You know, you know exactly where you are along the route and um, you're able to listen to your scanner. So this is certainly one of those cool things that I would strongly recommend. Another top five extra, Dale Osborne mention this and it is in the slide deck yet again you're in the sleeper you want to put that antenna nice and high and up this is a suction cup mount for the scanner antenna so you would take the rubber duck antenna that's on your scanner plug it into this put this up on the let's say this was the the window here so you would suction cup mount the antenna directly to the window on the inside of the train. You're not going to be able to snake it out on the outside, but on the inside of the train. And then you can put the scanner four feet anywhere near there. So if you want to put it down, down lower, you can. The antenna stays up high. So this is going to improve your reception on the train, especially if you're in a sleeper. You're able to set up your 
listening station or your your temporary scanner shack while you're traveling so good stuff there so definitely keep that in mind so I would definitely totally do that but yeah I just uh, I can't say enough about you know some of these tips and tricks many of you if you've traveled on train and you've got some suggestions that I haven't mentioned on the show feel free to mention them um, in the comments I'll be happy to uh, answer some of those questions um, you know in the second half of the presentation which we're coming up to right now <coughs> excuse me so those are some of our top five tips for using a scanner on a train so let me uh, let's take a look at some of the comments <coughs> excuse me so we've got um, we've got a lot of people that use the ending tone hopefully they're using this one this one's one of my favorites um, I got this from a company called Bridgecom. Um, a few years ago, I was having to work the booth for Scanner Master when I was working there full time. And uh, I saw this radio and I said, boy, this would be a great radio to have in addition to um, my scanner radio. So I basically said, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest in this radio and I love it. I programmed all 97 channels into this radio and that allows me to you know scroll to the channels somebody asked about the suction um antenna mount scanner master does carry it they're currently at the time of this broadcast they're out of stock on it you may be able to find it possibly in some other stores uh scanner stores or you may be able to check out that big uh online box store to see if they have it but you know that is um a really great thing it's not a lot of money it'll suction to any glass surface so let's say if I was using my scanner here at the let's say this was a hotel I could suction cup it to the window have my scanner right over here if it's within the four feet range and being able to have my scanner somewhat in front of me um, and have the antenna up on the glass which is really nice so definitely check uh, scanner master hopefully they'll get it back in stock soon if not check your uh, favorite scanner retail just to see if they have it listed on their website and if you can purchase it and then do definitely a search um, the other uh, the other thing that I recommend DPU channels and end of train channels a uh, great thing that was just mentioned by this viewer is programming uh, those channels in yes absolutely Typically, where I'll program them in, so the first two banks, bank one and two, are the first 97 railroad channels. Bank zero, I program the EOTs and DPU channels. So the great thing about those particular channels is there's not any um, voice audio on there, but there's what you hear is a series of beeps. And typically, you're going to hear those when the train is in close proximity of you. So you'll start to hear that, and you know that there's a train coming. Let's say you're on a line where um, they don't communicate on the radio a lot. Programming in these channels will allow you to be able to hear you know, those series of beeps. So you know, okay, so there's a train clearly coming or, or within a close proximity, so you can get ready for taking a photo. When you're riding the train, I probably wouldn't recommend it because it's going to pick up those EOT devices. Uh, typically, you know, a passenger train's not going to have a DPU, so you're not going to be hearing that. But I would always recommend programming that into one bank, a dedicated bank, so you're not always running that bank. So let's say if you're rail fanning just outside of uh, the Queensgate Yard um, here in Cincinnati. If you have that in, you're going to constantly hear beeping all the time. So at that point, you want to turn off bank zero. And then if you're rail fanning outside of the city, turn on bank zero and then listen for, you know, for that beeping indication of either the DPU or the EOT. So Dale mentions, and this is a great thing. Um, don't forget about your locals when traveling. So if you're looking to 
monitor you know not only the railroads but you look into monitor uh, public safety many of the public safety agencies are you're running with digital um, so you definitely would need um, you know a digital radio so you tell you can program it for your local local stuff and you can program it for um, the railroads as well Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Amtrak does not use any of those those channels. But yeah, you definitely want to. I couldn't remember that. It's been a while since I rode on Amtrak. But yeah, uh, according. Yeah, so they're not going to be using that. But you can have it turned on or turned off, especially if you're traveling through um, a section where there could be freight. If you're hearing those uh, those channels going off, typically you know that you're going to either you know be passing a freight train or a freight train could be passing you. Um, depending on if it's a double line or whatever it may be. So it's definitely some good stuff there. Um, let's see. I'm just going to take a look at a few of the check-ins. Of course, you know, uh, Nigel checking in. Let's go rail fanning. Jim checking in, asking what is the best scanner for rail fanning. That uh, probably would be right now the 125 AT. Lincoln, KC, Chris Schultz, Les, just to name a few, Charles, Charles, uh, Charles watching, a lot of new uh, people watching as well, uh, CJ, and a whole bunch of others. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in, and of course, uh, Dale and Mike and, and uh, Trey, um, but yeah, there's a lot of people watching tonight, if I didn't get you, um, you know, I appreciate you watching. Let me go over a couple of slides and then we'll answer any other questions that you have before we wrap up the presentation. So let's uh, share the slide deck one more time. And then if you've got any other questions, um, post them in the comments right now. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any of those questions before we wrap up the show. So we want to remind you, definitely support the Train Aficionado channel, not only by hitting the subscribe button. If you haven't done it already, do it right now. Make sure you check out the store, trainaficionado.com is the website for the blog. You'll be able to see uh, some of our rail fanning guides on the website. You'll be able to see a button for the store and, of course, you know all of our blog entries. And also our event page. We also have a, an event coming up, which I'll mention in a moment. I didn't end up creating a slide for it, but I'll mention it in a moment. We also have great videos throughout the whole entire channel, Train Aficionado. Um, the last video that we posted was rail fanning for beginners. So if you're getting into the hobby of rail fanning and you want to know the very, very basics, watch this video. You can find it on the YouTube channel. As always, follow, like, and subscribe to our social media as well. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Next show, right after the 4th of July, Wednesday, July 5th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. So tune in, watch for our next show. Can't wait to be able to do another uh, great show for you guys. And as you see in the live chat, if you do have any suggestions for topics for Train Aficionado, make sure you drop us an email. You can do it through the website if you don't remember the email address. It's actually trainaficionado, um, show at gmail.com if, if you're able to remember that. If not, um, definitely do it through the website. There is a spot there where you can contact us. Right. This is tonight's topic of discussion was the top uh, five tips for using a scanner on a train. So really cool stuff there. Um, I want to mention that we do have an event coming up, um, which I'm going to tell you about in a second, where we've been meeting up um, with many members of the Cincinnati Railroad Club. And myself and a lot of viewers of the channel have been meeting up rail fanning um, throughout the Cincinnati area. So if you're, um, you know, from the Cincinnati area, definitely uh, join us at our next rail fanning meetup, which uh, is going to be uh, Saturday, July the 8th 
from 9 a.m. to noon. We'll be at the Ludlow Rail Fanning Tower. So come out, hang out with us. Uh, it's going to be a lot of us from the club. You don't have to be a part of the club to come hang out. I'll be there from 9 a.m. to noon. Bring a cool beverage and there's benches up on the tower so we can uh, sit there and relax and uh, watch the trains. Um, this particular tower is located right off of the Cincinnati Rat Hole line, which runs from Cincinnati down to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Quite a bit of uh, traffic on there. I was out there last Sunday. I don't know how long I was there. I saw a whole bunch of trains. Uh, it was a really good time. Uh, met a family up on the uh, the tower. They were telling me about their YouTube channel. I subscribed to it. Looks like some good stuff there. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely come out. Love to meet you. Um, that'll be once again Saturday, uh, July the eighth, uh, nine a.m. to noon. So, and you can learn more about this event at trainaficionado.com under the event page. We got a brand new website. So if you haven't been to the website as of recently, uh, check out the website. Here's the brand new website. You can check out you know, some of our trending blog posts that are on there right now, some of our Forgotten Railroad blog posts. We're also launching a blog post that'll be a series with trackside great places to eat. So we'll be doing that relatively soon. Um, and you'll be able to do some rail fanning and have some food places suggested because, of course, when you're trackside, you get hungry and you want to go get something to eat. We're going to recommend some great places trackside to dine. So we're going to start doing that uh, relatively soon. But I really appreciate everyone that's watching the broadcast. If you could do me a huge favor, share this broadcast on your social media. Um, if you've enjoyed it, post it. Let people know that, that share the same common interests in us, that there's a YouTube channel uh, dedicated to live broadcasts and, of course, uh, some produced stuff. We would love to grow the channel as much as we can, but definitely uh, share the post, uh, give us a thumbs up on the video, and, of course, subscribe. We greatly appreciate that. Um, great weather's here, finally. Get out there, do some rail fanning, do it safely. We can't wait to... Catch you again right here on Train Aficionado Live. Love to meet you trackside in Ludlow next month. So if you're in the area, come out. Love to meet you in person. Spend some time you know, chatting with you, watching some trains. Uh, greatly appreciate it to everyone tonight. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us this evening. I'm Jonathan Higgins from our Cincinnati studios. We'll catch you again soon. Have a great night.